Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On this episode, we're joined by Reagan Miller. Reagan is a reporter for KRBD, a radio station in Ketchikan, Alaska. She covers Alaska native and rural issues as part of the Report for America program. Prior to that, she was a reporter for the Ketchikan Daily News for three and a half years. She's a lifelong Alaskan. Hi, Reagan. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Give us a sense for where Ketchikan is. Sure. So we're in the southern portion of the panhandle nearby us would be Metlakatla, which is the state's only native reservation that's across the water from us. And then we have Prince of Wales Island. There's about 11 different communities on that island. That's also about a three hour ferry ride from us. So we're in that lower portion of the panhandle. We don't get all the crazy snow and uh, freezing like you would see um, in the northern parts of the state. So what's your journalism origin story? That's a great question. And it's kind of weird to think about, but I don't think that I have a journalism origin story. I just kind of always knew that it was a job that I wanted. I was always reading and learning and asking annoying questions and researching anything that really struck my fancy. So when it was time to go and kind of pick a path in life, I fell into it uh, fairly naturally. And I was actually doing a semester at the University of Alaska Southeast. Uh, that branch here in Ketchikan, when I got my first job as a reporter at the Ketchikan Daily News, and then uh, three and a half years later, fell into this position at KRBD. So all of my journalism training has been through webinars from the Pointer Institute, webinars that America has offered me, and it's been, a, I think, kind of a unique story. Certainly. All right. So is there anything from your upbringing or heritage, maybe uh, relatives or just anything within your family that would have lent itself to telling stories? Uh, the boring answer for you, Mark, would be no. Uh, the only thing I could really think of was my mother was a teacher, and she actually used um, a lot of her time to homeschool my brother and I uh, all the way through high school. And it was never really an option growing up in the house to not be reading something or learning something. And I was always um, writing, always trying to tell my own stories. I was one of those kids who wrote all their own stories and I even remember trying to create like a tiny little newspaper, like when I was a kid. Um, So I think I was just always naturally inclined to be reading and writing so much that it was just kind of always something that I fell into very naturally. So this is your first foray into radio, right? Yes, it is. What's, What's that been like? It's been a huge adjustment. I don't know how prepared I was going into it for that kind of adjustment, but everybody here at KRBD has the patience of a saint, so that that helps. Um, but in a way, you have to be like a lot more careful about everything than you do with print reporting. You have to be more careful about the quality of your audio because other people are going to hear that. You have to be thinking about how you can use the sounds that you're getting to amplify the story instead of hinder it. And all of the technology and the like microphones and using the Adobe Audition and even just getting on Slack and being part of the Alaska Public Radio Network has been a huge adjustment. So you already alluded to uh, what the geography of where you are is like, but can you give some perspective on what the towns themselves are like and what the rural issues might be in places like Craig, Alaska, or Whale Pass, or Thorn Bay, or some of these other towns that are very small in population that you're covering? Definitely. So Ketchikan is very much like the big city to those places. People come over here for vacations, or they make long weekends out of it, stock up by going to Walmart, and it's a big thing. I actually lived in Craig for five years, and when I was there, the population was around 1,300. Um, Thorn Bay is, you know, hovering, uh, gosh, I don't even remember nowadays, Um, but it has grown a little bit since I've been there. A lot of the issues are related to subsistence hunting and fishing. So the um, things in the land and in the water that you can hunt and the different um, limits and capacities to which you can do that. Timber and logging is a huge thing over there. There's a lot of discussion about whether uh, we should be moving away from old growth logging. So those older trees or um, young growth logging and the different mills over to there. And especially for Whale Pass, there's a timber sale right now that the residents are very much so against. 
um, the students at that school there actually wrote a letter to the governor asking to um, halt the sale. And I'm still following up on that, but very much um, land-based issues. Um, and tourism is also another huge thing. I know for Cloak, which is a village there um, of less than a thousand people, they're getting their first small cruise ships in in May. And that is a huge source of um, income coming into the town, but it's also in their old logging uh, dock where the boats would come in with timber. So it's also kind of seeing that old industry kind of fade out as tourism comes in. And there's a lot of folks who are really excited about it. And there are some who have a lot of trepidation about whether or not it's going to kind of um, mix badly with their culture and way of life. Sort of, sort of, essentially, a story of change and uh, people's different reactions uh, to change. I'm looking at some of the other things that you've covered recently: uh, a series on Ketchikan totem pole uh, carvers, a number of stories uh, about totem poles, which I think is somewhat uh, unique, distinct to Alaska. A new casino in a town of less than 800. Uh, state championship athletics. The reuniting of a Ketchikan resident and Vietnam refugees. He helped get into the United States. A hunter being rescued, uh, you and you mentioned Cloak uh, becoming a port for large cruise ships, all sorts of different things. Uh, can you give us a sense of how the story ideas kind of come together and how you divide up between feature type things and hard news? This is a great question. And the thing about KRBD and Alaska in general is that there's really no shortage of news. There's always something that at least I believe someone should be paying more attention to and kind of working to shine that spotlight on. And since getting to know a little bit more about the people on Metlakatla and Prince of Wales, kind of like developing closer bonds with them, um, there's typically always something lurking in the back of my mind on a slow news day. And I spend a lot of time on community Facebook pages. I read a lot of municipal meeting agendas. I look at um, you know, with the calendar to see what sorts of events are coming up that might be interesting to tune into. And I spend a lot of time lurking on like national news sites too to see what sort of events out there might be able to be boiled down to a local level that people might be able to relate to a little bit more. But there are days where our news director just throws something my way that needs to be kind of handled right then. So I might have a week where I don't get to any of those kind of featurey ideas, or I might have a couple of weeks where I am um, producing features few and far in between. Um, so the division is it something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. It kind of is, again, a very natural um you, you do what you have time for. And I definitely think that my heart probably lies a little bit more in those featurey type of stories. Uh, what is it something like a deer summit like to cover? Oh my gosh. Um, it was overwhelming. It brought in so many people from all corners of the state, ecologists and conservationists. It brought in local hunters, biologists, and just the wealth of knowledge in that room was really intimidating to walk into. And everybody's very opinionated on that topic over there on Prince of Wales. It's an issue that everybody cares about, whether or not it's because they use um, deer as the main source of food over there. Grocery prices are a lot higher up here than in the lower 48. So a lot of people prefer to hunt as opposed to um, going and buying um, meat products from the store. Predator control and the wolves is a huge hot issue over there. So I really felt like I was getting to sit in at the the very the very bottom local level of how people feel about these issues, and it gave me a lot of appreciation for uh, the connections in that town. That's certainly something that I think is specific to Alaska and probably a very few other states. But something that's a little bit more specific on a national level. You also covered locals protesting the decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. What, what was that like? That was one of my very first assignments that I did for KBD, and it, I think it was the first time that I actually took my microphone and went out. And I remember being behind um, just like a line of these people who were walking down the street trying to get pictures of their signs. And um, for a minute, it just kind of gave me um, goosebumps. You know, I'm sitting here and there is this event that is something so big um, that, you know, here's this town in Alaska and they have some some loud opinions about it, but I remember trying to follow them in my in my car, and I was constantly pulling over to you know uh, roll down my window and get my microphone out of it to get that sound. So it was uh, a very powerful experience to be one of the first times getting sound for a story. How big is the staff that you're that you're working with? We are five people. Oh wow! Uh, so so that's uh, that's kind of like the ultimate in uh, small town radio. Yeah, we have two reporters. It's myself and the news director and our morning edition host. 
also does some stories as she can. And then we have a development director and a general manager, and that is the entire staff. With the fact that you're small and with the fact that you're a city around all these smaller towns, uh, you get opportunities to do some things that I think some others that might work in the Report for America realm don't necessarily get, like getting to interview the governor of the state. What was that like? Again, that was one of the very first things I did here for KRBD and working at the newspaper. I had seen other reporters, more senior reporters than myself, um, do that same thing with the governor. But doing it myself was a very overwhelming experience. I also was incredibly uncomfortable in the studio, looking at all of the sound levels and making sure everybody was talking into the microphone and keeping an eye on my question list and keeping a good flow of conversation. And there were three guests. I had only been prepared for two. It was all um, a very fast paced and overwhelming experience. But I was also really grateful that he was able to stop by and, and give me that time of his. But, you know, the thing that I remember most from that interview is just it felt like I had to have, uh, you know, four different sets of eyes to successfully do it. But what I think is maybe the thing that I take away from most is a couple of weeks later that Roby Wade decision came through. And that's one of the topics that I talked with him about. So I had some tape from him very recently that I was able to give to other reporters in my network and also use myself to do a more local story on that national news, which I think. Um, was a really great. And that was that uh, that there was nothing essentially for him to do because it was in the state constitution and you had talked to him about that and the constitutional convention potentially uh, within the state. Uh, it was, uh, uh, if you uh, if you had it to do again, could I ask you how you might do it differently? That's a great question. I, I might have dug a little bit deeper to ask about its place in the Constitution and tried to draw out more of his personal opinion on it, because I feel like in, in this time, so many people are looking to their elected leaders for their stance on it to decide how they vote. And I feel like um, Dunleavy's answer, which was to leave it you know, to the voters and that's also protected in the state's Constitution, but we have the possibility of this Constitutional Convention. I feel like I would have tried to hit that home a little bit harder and come away with a more clear picture of what that could look like in his eyes. What kind of, uh, what was the process of, of preparing the questions for that like? Because I imagine there's a lot of research that goes into an interview like that. Yeah, I did a lot of talking with my news director and I did a lot of messaging back and forth in the radio network Slack channel, trying to get eyes on what reporters in other areas of the state were also thinking about. And I did a lot of trying to hone it into my beat, which is the uh, indigenous and rural issues, Asian American folks, Alaska Native folks, and then trying to bring the questions closer to topics on my beat, things like tribal sovereignty. Um, so it was a lot of brainstorming and letting things simmer. And I took a home a lot of it. I, I was constantly thinking about questions to ask him, you know, making dinner, waking up in the morning, brushing my teeth. So it was a lot of just really sitting in it. <laughs> but that that's what happens, I would think, when anyone gets a, sh a shot at interviewing the governor, whether it's New York or Alaska, uh, certainly. I want to go back to the technique of reporting uh, and talk about uh, the idea of something that you now have to think about as a radio reporter compared to print, and that's getting sound. And I was thinking about one story that you did in particular uh, on totem pole carvers. Um, you were doing something on the totem pole trail trail in Juneau, Alaska. There was a quote about this being done to help restore the culture, uh, and the sound was very distinct. The smell of cedar fills the carving shed in Saxman. Tourists chatter and snap pictures, watching and listening to master carver Nathan Jackson as he works his craft on a 25-foot log. Uh, how how do you go about uh, trying to identify what sound you want to get in the story, maybe using that one as an example? So that was a story that I was incredibly excited to cover. The folks that I talked to for that story are very renowned and respected in Ketchikan, and it was such a delight to be able to kind of push my way through that crowd of tourists and sit in in his carving studio for an hour. And it smells fantastic. The smell of cedar is just so strong in there. Um, but the idea of getting sound, it's usually one of the first things that I notice when I go somewhere for a story. Whatever jumps out to me is usually what I want to open my story with. And that sound of carving is something that's um, very sentimental to people here, especially for local audiences. They know what that sounds like. It can transport them to that particular place. And for audiences that aren't as familiar, um, 
it's just this really interesting opener that I think really sets up that, that sense of place early on in the story. So that's something that I try to decide, like, while I'm still on, on the scene and remember to go and point my microphone at it and get more than I need. That's something that my news director told me as soon as I started here. Um, he's like, get, get more sound than you think you'll need if you want to ask people to um, just uh, sit in silence for just a quick minute while you get some background sound. Make sure you do that because it's going to be worth it. And I think that story was the time that I learned that that was such good advice. Um, uh, how much listener feedback do you get when you do a piece like that? I get a fair bit. And that's something that's so different with um, the radio reporting as compared to the newspaper reporting as well. Just because we have a broader social media presence, I get a lot of comments on Facebook. And I get a lot of people that when they come into the station to make a donation or to host one of their volunteer shows, they say, hey, I really enjoyed that story. Or the really great thing is when I get to that level with source when they might have my cell phone number and they text me details when they, you know, throw me a text after that story. Like, I love how you did that or I love how you put this together. So I get a fair bit of listener feedback and that's something that I really value. Uh, what makes covering Alaska distinct? That's a huge question and it's really hard to answer. It's a place that people spend thousands of dollars to come and visit for just a few days. And I think it's a place that's treated sort of like a great unknown by books and pop culture and movies. And I think that vastness is what makes it really distinct. My reporting down here in the panhandle is going to look very different from someone who is up north or in the bush. Everything that people might take for granted down south, like um, having anything they want in the mail sent to them or malls or being able to drive from one state line to another, that's just not the case up here. So I feel like we have really interesting stories to tell that are going to be interesting to just about anybody because there is that sense of newness and just how big it is up here. So I feel like that's what makes it distinct. And I would imagine that the Native American uh, indigenous uh, culture there is certainly new to a lot of people. What has it been like to experience and cover that? It's been a very rewarding and educational experience. Um, I myself am not Indigenous. I've grown up in Alaska, born and raised here. So I always lived in communities that had very strong Indigenous culture. And it's been so interesting to hear from people about what everything means as tribal sovereignty moves forward, as Ketchikan's tribe was pushing to get that rural designation to open up their hunting regulations to feed their families. Um, totem poles being raised as that missing and murdered Indigenous women movement comes uh, really to a head. It's been a really educational experience to hear things from, from everybody else's perspective about this place that I was born and raised in, but that is Indigenous land. And it has been an absolute pleasure to have everybody work with me from these local tribes and just describe their upbringing here. What has it been like to try and gain their trust? That's a great question. And that's something that Report for America has really talked a lot about with their reporters focusing on Indigenous communities. And everybody has been so welcoming of my efforts to really amplify my reportings on their voices. So I feel like what's really important is letting them know that I am here as a public service to tell their stories. I like to think of myself kind of as that vessel to get their stories out. That's what Report for America teaches their members. So I feel like coming forward with that attitude has been a very successful thing for me. And I appreciate everybody's time. I ask so many questions and everybody has been very gracious from the local tribe answering those questions. So many questions. What are the other characteristics of your reporting? So aside from the indigenous topics, um, I also report on just rural issues. So a lot of that is, again, the hunting, fishing, the logging and the timber sales. Um, there was a recent lawsuit from some parents in the school district who were going against the posting of Southeast Alaska traditional tribal values, um, which were created by some indigenous elders uh, in the state. And a lot of it just really focuses on those types of issues. But I also focus on the Asian American community and that's coverage that I really want to expand. I think I'm working on a story right now about traditional Filipino dances. We currently, we used to have a ton of Filipino dance classes here in Ketchikan and the Wellness Coalition just recently got a sizable grant to start those programs up. So I've been reaching out to people who either used to take classes or their kids take classes or their teachers to hear a little bit more about what those dance forms mean to them. 
So those are the things that I focus on, and I definitely want to do a better job, I think, balancing the coverage of the Indigenous and Asian American community. What are the characteristics of your reporting? One, you said you ask a lot of questions. What other things uh, are are Reagan Miller characteristics? Yeah, asking a lot of questions, um, always double checking the spelling of names. Uh, and I think I, when I do a story, I'm typically throwing everything on the page and writing for maybe a good 30 or 45 minutes and then stepping away from it and coming back and combing through it again. But most of what I actually keep in my end draft hits in that first, you know, word vomit onto the page. I'm not really giving myself too much of an outline that I'm following. I do a lot of that refining after. And I find that's actually a more successful technique for me because I'm focusing more on how I say something than where it's actually going in the story. So that's your technique. What does a day in the life look for you? Maybe pick a recent day and kind of walk us through it. Um, so I try to be in the office really early. I find those early morning hours when there's not too much going on to be when I write most of my stories. So I try to come in early and I try to leave on time. It doesn't always happen. But I really try to do nothing but writing my drafts in that first part of my day. And the last part, I'm still a little bit slow when it comes to putting together sounds and mixing everything down. So I really try to reserve the last bit of my day for, for doing that. And at KRBD, we also do web versions of our stories at the same time that we're doing the audio version. So I'm getting the radio story ready for our newscast, which is at 5.35 every night, and we'll repeat those stories in the morning. So I'm getting that radio version ready, and then I might have to come back, and I kind of rewrite things for, for the web version, and then I put in the pictures and all of those appropriate things and throw them up on the web. So usually the last half of the day descends into to chaos. So you can be a photographer too. I'm the photographer. I'm the web editor. I am the radio reporter. Uh, so yeah, we do a lot of things here. How has being a journalist shaped how you view the world? Sure. Um, I mean, first things first, I can't go grocery shopping without seeing something that I think would make an interesting story. But the job has been continuing to change my worldview. It's given me more of a drive to dive deeper into things and to not accept what I might see as the truth on the surface. And I feel a lot more comfortable asking questions than I might if I had not been a journalist. I feel a lot more comfortable just saying, heads up, this is going to be a really weird question, but I really want to know. And then I'm just asking somebody something. And I think especially Report for America has made me look closer at stories and think who else could have told the story? What voice might not be here? So I find myself to be a lot more curious since kind of expanding my journalism career. How has being in report, uh, okay, you, you essentially just answered, how has report, uh, being in Report for America been helpful to you? What's an example of something that you might take to a mentor to try to figure out? Yeah, I actually have a Report for America mentor. I meet with her every month. She reads kind of my uh, most recent work and brings it back and says, here's what I like or here's what I thought might have been missing. What I might bring to a mentor at Report for America they're basically there for anything. I might come to her with a problem when it comes to balancing all of the trainings and my service project. I teach a class at the local junior, senior high school, and I meet with them every Wednesday and sometimes planning for that and teaching the class and then coming back and meeting deadlines and coming up with stories is a lot. So we're encouraged to go to our mentors for questions about how to balance it all. If I am having problems getting sources to open up or talk to me or finding a good way to ask sensitive questions, that's another good thing that I might go to my mentor for. How do you uh, view fairness in the role of what you do? Fairness, that's a great question. And I thought about this a lot when you sent it to me. Um, it's also a really hard question. I like to think that fairness is when everybody is given the best chance that they'll have to do something. And that might look a lot different for everybody. I'm working on a story right now with candidates for local tribal council. And some of the people are unable to call me on the phone for, for whatever reason and they want to give a written statement, and that might be what's fair to them, but it's not necessarily what's fair to someone else who is um, able to pick up the phone and call me. So I try to think of everybody's um, situations and how they might view something when I decide what's fair when I'm doing my job, uh, especially for stories that have lots of people and I might be waiting for them to get back to me or uh, to be able to answer some of my questions. And I try to think, has everybody been given the best chance that they'll have to be able to succeed or do what they're being asked? You mentioned earlier you try to get in early and leave on time. What hours do you work? Usually I'm in here by 7.30, 7.45, and I try to be out the door by 4. 
Sometimes I will fill in for our morning news host and I'm in closer to 645. And usually I'm pretty good about getting out about eight hours later, but sometimes it's just too exciting to leave. <laughs> so, all right. So wait, so you're like the news anchor in the morning sometimes? Sometimes. If our regular house needs a break, I will go in and uh, fill in. And that's been also really exciting and a little bit nerve wracking because we have a phone flasher next to our soundboard. And I remember I pronounced a name of a canal wrong. And I did that all week as I was filling in for our news host. And somebody called on Friday and said, I just wanted to let your backup host know they've been pronouncing this wrong the entire week. And I was devastated. But I've also had people tell me, like, I heard you driving to work in my car and they thought that was super cool. And it might be one of my favorite things is to come into the studio and have those guests and do all of those automation things and make news clips sound um, like they're all flowing together. That's pretty fun. How do you view uh, where you fit in journalism for your future career? Yeah, it's definitely something that um, I am fully on this track. I am just getting started. There's so much that I don't know. Uh, thank goodness for my very solid news director. Um, but I really just want to keep the perspective that I have now, which is learning and taking on anything. I've taken on a, a lot of weird, random stories from my combined time at the newspaper and here. And I want to keep that attitude. You know, no story is too small. I want to hear everything and I want to learn everything. It is Alaska the intended destination of where you plan to be? Throughout? I think so. I have a soft spot for it. Wow. That's, that's, uh, why do you love Alaska so much? Oh, geez, Mark. Um, gosh, I think that there was just something so unique about growing up in Alaska. I always lived on the waterfront, right on, right on the beach. And I think a lot of it could be taken for granted, you know, having that ocean right outside your door. But there is just something so interesting about the volume of stories that come out of Alaska. And some of it is, yeah, you know, we have really big cities like Anchorage. And we have really small places, like some of the villages that are covered on Prince of Wales, like Kazan, that's around 30 people. And they just had their first ever totem pole repatriation and came back to the village after 100 years, almost being scrapped down south. Um, so there's just something really interesting that's a huge draw about never knowing what type of story might come out of Alaska. And what's cool about this is that you're the definitive story in just about every case. Like it, it's you or, it, or it's not. I, I would think. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, that really does hit me. Ketchikan is a s small place. It's it's bigger than a lot of the places in Alaska, but it's still small by down south standards. And I hear people talking about reporting while I am eating at the library or if I'm at the grocery store. And it really does hit me like, okay, wow, people are turning to me as the source. A lot of people at Ketchikan really prefer their local news. They don't want to go to the New York Times or the Associated Press. They want their local radio or their local paper. And that can be a lot of pressure. I really don't want to get something wrong. And they looked to me to paint the whole picture. So that's a huge reminder that I really need to do my job well. Two last questions to wrap up here. Uh, what advice would you have for someone applying to be a part of Report for America? Be humble. Definitely don't go in thinking that you know everything because um, those first few months are definitely a huge learning curve. Not everybody goes in changing beats like I do, but the way that Report for America will get you into a community, trying to learn the fabric of it and make all these connections, getting you into classrooms with kids, um, you definitely need to be prepared to be humbled about what you don't know. And you, you will make mistakes. Uh, it, it happens. But how you correct them is also going to be very valuable. So that open-mindedness and humility is going to be key. Sounds like you're doing a great job learning on the job, learning as you go. The show is called The Journalism Salute because we're saluting you for your good work, and we ask that you do likewise. Is there a journalist or journalism organization that you would like to salute for their good work? I have to shout out, speaking of Report for America, Theo Greenlee. He's a Report for America Corps member, and he's working at KUCB over in Unalaska. Unalaska has had so many interesting stories come out of a very small newsroom. I was just listening to Theo in our Report for America kind of Zoom holiday party where we all zoomed in from our newsrooms to talk about what we were working on. And he does so much work. He, he does everything, just everything over there at the station. And it's really interesting how he has so many newscasts to do and all these different deadlines. And he doesn't have an on-site editor. He's working with somebody uh, over Slack, over Google Docs and brainstorming that way. 
and in Alaska and the entire Aleutians area is such an interesting place. So whether it's the Bering Sea crab fishery or some record rainfall, I think was Theo's last story. It's all super interesting. And I think that they definitely need some more support. Cool. Shout out to him. Uh, Reagan, uh, Reagan Miller, a reporter for KRBD in Ketrick and Alaska and the Report for America program. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Report for America is accepting applications to be part of its core member program for 2023-24. The deadline is January 30th. Report for America helps local newsrooms report on undercovered issues and communities by sending reporters and photographers to newsrooms across the country. It's a two-year program with an optional third year. This class begins work on July 10th. Report for America, local journalism, national service. Learn more at reportforamerica.org. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at JournalismSalute at gmail.com.